You've eaten Gotham's wealth, its spirit, but your feast is nearly over. From this moment on, none of you are safe. Seeing as there's a brand new Batman movie coming out, that details the beginning stages of the Dark Knight's time as Gotham's silent protector, I figured what better time than now to check out another Batman movie that did the very same. I'm talking, of course, about Now, going into this review, I've not only never seen this movie before prior to making this, but I've also never read the classic comic book that it's based on. So I guess you could say I'm going into this one blind as a bat. Exactly. This movie does a really good job of immediately establishing how crime-ridden Gotham City is. We're not just talking about the more than occasional muggings that Gotham City's famous for. We're immediately shown the corruption of this city's cops. They're completely careless in their actions, which can make some come off as a bit lackadaisical, but it also shows a lot of them being opportunistic. We're immediately shown the GCPD taking liberties with civilians of the city, attacking and otherwise manhandling Gothamites, and disregarding and dismissing truth in the favor of covering their own asses. It's a comb, Flas. Hey, I'm only human, Jimmy. In this Gotham, having a badge is a ticket to do whatever you want. We see Detective Flash use excessive force in circumstances where even force alone would be excessive. We're shown the reckless and carefree shoot first and don't bother even asking questions later mentality that these officers have. One less mouth to feed at the soap kitchen. We're catapulted into this crime-ridden world, and we're instantaneously made aware of how deep the corruption goes. When it comes to Commissioner Loeb, it's not just a matter of negligence, it's a matter of endorsing this sort of unethical behavior. And not even just endorsing it, but enforcing it. The men on the most wanted list aren't all that hard to find for the GCPD, because they're sitting right across the dinner table from them. There is a seat at Don Falcone's table reserved for the commissioner. It's very obvious that the system is rigged, and the only people not getting away with crime are the ones who can't afford to. We're not talking about one bad apple spoiling the bunch. If anything, Jim is the proverbial good apple in a spoiled bunch. Except this apple's not getting spoiled, it's... He's, he's fighting back. Okay, yeah, so that wasn't that great, but you trying to make every metaphor meaningful. Jim is the only cop in Gotham on the straight and narrow, because everyone else is about as crooked as the Eiffel Tower. See that? I rebounded from that Apple thing right quick, didn't I? We also see how they go about handling other police officers who aren't compliant with their villainy, as they group together and viciously assault Gordon on his way to work. That's their own brother in blue there. He's one of their own. But because he didn't act in their code of misconduct, they treat him as if he were on the other side of the handcuffs. They also set out to execute Batman before ever even trying to take him in. Not because he's a supposed violent criminal or a danger to the city, but because he's doing the job that they should be doing. The difference between Batman and the police of Gotham City is that Batman serves justice while the GCPD serve power. He's enemy number one for one reason and one reason only. And that's because Batman does what's right while the police do what's right for themselves. Did I say that? We're shown the misery of Gotham City in ways that I don't think have ever properly been done outside of this. This movie really does a great job of emphasizing the misery of Gotham City. It's a city so awful that all throughout the movie, Jim Gordon is having a crisis and blaming himself for bringing a child into a city so devoid of positive qualities. Imagine thinking having your child not exist at all would be better for them than having to live in a certain zip code. Batman Year One does a really great job of establishing just how broken the city is prior to the Dark Knight's arrival and James Gordon's rising in the ranks. And I love it for that. Because far too often in Batman movies are we told just how bad things are, rather than actually being shown how bad they are. The latter makes everything feel that much more impactful. I mean, sure, there's been other Batman movies that show us muggings, they show us criminals, they show us crooks, maybe even the occasional thug. But they don't show you just how corrupt the police department in this city is. I like this movie because it emphasizes that. 
Now we see that you have a whole city full of bad guys, but no good guys to turn to for help. This movie gives Gotham City its own unique character. And that character kind of takes center stage and makes all of the lead supporting characters in it. More than being Batman Year One, this movie is really kind of like a Gotham Year One. BB. Before Batman. I feel like this movie is what the show Gotham initially set out to be. A story about a young Bruce and a young Gordon finding their own ways of justice in a city of scum. Seeing movies and comics depict the origin or early years of Bruce Wayne as Batman is always fun to me. You know, the movie-going and comic-reading public have become far too used to the Batman who had a contingency plan for every member of the Justice League. The guy takes out Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, no problem. Barely breaks a sweat. Meanwhile here, he's having a hard time handling three ordinary run-of-the-mill thugs. It's nice to know that the Dark Knight's never been a Gary Stew. He didn't just put on a costume and suddenly have all the skills. We get to see him fuck up, we get to see him fail. We even get to hear him drop an F-bomb under his breath when he's upset at his own mess up. You can tell that there's a lot of potential there. You see glimpses of the Batman we all know, but he's not quite there yet. And I think because of this, viewers are a little bit more on edge whenever he's in danger. Because you know that this Batman might not have those contingency plans ready. In this movie, he's not Batman just yet. He's the man who's trying to be Batman. In this movie, he's much more man than Batman. Do you remember all those old, loose cannon cop cliches movies like to do back in the day? So-and-so is a cop who doesn't play by the rules. Well, in a weird way, because of how backwards the city of Gotham is, Jim Gordon is kind of like that loose cannon cop. Ironically enough, because he does play by the rules, unlike all of those he works with. The guy is an outlaw, because he wants to do things by the book. Jim Gordon is a capeless hero in a city of maskless villains. He stands out and that makes him a target. Not from the criminals who walk the streets, but from the criminals he shares a cubicle with. Batman Year One shows us different sides of the characters. It gives us a more vulnerable, almost lost Bruce Wayne who is so desperate to find a path that he asks for guidance from a head bust of his dearly departed dad showing us that while Bruce is a good guy, maybe he's not the perfect picture of sanity. He's a broken individual who wants to find something to believe in, even if he has to become it himself. It gives us a James Gordon who in a moment of weakness and selfishness, cheats on his partner with his partner, which shows us that despite Jim Gordon obviously having a moral compass, even he can stray from the path. I like all of this because it makes these characters seem flawed. And in making them flawed, they seem... human. What is it they say? To err is... To err is human. To err is human! So, uh... I mean, it doesn't always serve the narrative of the plot, or further it, per se, but I do think it adds a realm of realism to everything. These characters aren't just characters, they're people. Blemishes, warts, bad ears, and all. Not everything in the movie is set up and paid off. Catwoman, somewhat inspired by Batman, takes to the streets. Gordon cheats on Barbara, but then that's kind of glossed over. He fesses up, comes clean, tells her, and then we don't even get to see her reaction. So, uh... Like, his police partner only exists for him to cheat on his wife with. So, she doesn't really get a whole lot to do. Well, besides Jim, that is. There are elements to this movie that are just there to be there. Not that I necessarily have a problem with that. These moments may not further the plot, but they do a good job of world building and telling us more about the characters of this world. Harvey Dent and Batman are shown to be on secret speaking terms, but what is discussed between the two isn't really known. Plus the fact that there's so much going on in the city that it kind of dilutes the viewer's perception of what's going to come next. I really like the fact that Jim and his partner Sarah actually suspect Bruce as being Batman. And they also have a lot of reason to. I mean, Bruce returns to Gotham and then two weeks later, this bat fella tries to come around and take a bite out of crime? They have valid reasons to be suspicious of him. They note that he has the motive to do it due to his parents' murder, and he has the money to do it, also due to his parents' murder. Of course, when Jim goes to question Bruce, he's already mid-alibi and putting on one hell of a show. But to Jim's credit, he's not necessarily buying it. 
He doesn't rule out that Bruce Wayne could be a shallow, misogynistic, woman-crazy, boastful billionaire, but he doesn't immediately write him off as being that. He even notes that all that he does could just be a persona. I gotta say, Jim Gordon in this movie? Infinitely smarter than he is in most other movies. I think there's a lot to compare and contrast, but mostly compare, between Batman Year One and Batman The Long Halloween. They practically have the same cast of characters, what with Batman, Jim Gordon, and Catwoman being in the leads, and also Harvey Dent being thrown somewhere in there. The time period both these movies take place in showcasing a much younger, inexperienced Bruce behind the cowl, showing Batman establishing himself in Gotham City, and establishing connections and relationships within Gotham City. Having a narrative that proverbially rips pages off the calendar, I think these two movies are very much alike, both in terms of what these movies are, and in terms of how good both these movies are. I love Batman The Long Halloween, and I love Batman Year One. I think both of these movies are some of the greatest depictions of a younger Batman that I've ever seen. And I think they're even greater depictions of the city before it got its protectors. And both movies show why Gotham needed them. You gotta think that Gotham City is bad enough with Batman and Commissioner Gordon. But both these animated movies show you just how much worse off it was without them. If there's anything I need to critique or comment on, it's this. There is only one thing that I can't stand about this movie, and it's that there's not enough of it. Running about only an hour long, this movie makes you long for more. More from this movie, more from this universe, just more overall. I mean, this movie's only called Batman Year One. We need an immediate Batman Year Two through 22. Hell, 32, even. Sign me up, I'm there. It almost feels like this entire movie is a prelude to what comes next. But unfortunately, that's all she wrote, which is kind of a bummer. The movie follows Bruce and Gordon both looking for justice. And it's nice to see their separate paths cross and finally align right before the credits roll. A maskless Batman manages to save the life of Jim's newborn son. And Jim Gordon, this cop who believes in a code, in ethics, in doing everything by the book, doesn't turn him in. He literally turns a blind eye to his identity. Claiming, My glasses! I can't see without them! That is a really powerful moment and a solid foundation to a working partnership and eventual friendship that will last for years to come. How many years? I don't know! It depends on if this Batman ever intends on banging Jim Gordon's future daughter. No, don't like that. Let's hope not. The end stinger that sets up a potential follow-up Joker story feels almost identical to the ending of Batman Begins. And I'm gonna guess that that's probably where that movie took its inspiration from. Pro probably from year one, the comic. There's a lot to love about this movie. I like the relationships, the dynamics, and the come up of the characters in this movie. But I also like a lot of the little things that are done in the background. Getting to see Bruce and Selina have their first lover spat, long before they're lovers. Or even acquainted. It's nice seeing Harvey not being two-faced, and seeing him have some sort of working relationship with Batman in a trusting capacity. Year One also does an amazing job of establishing the standard criminals of Gotham City. I don't always care for the mob bosses and the crime lords of the criminal underworld. I feel like if I wanted to see that, I would just turn on the Sopranos. But I have to say, when it's done right, it's done right. And here, it's done pretty good. The movie also has an all-star cast, casting future Jim Gordon, Ben McKenzie, as this universe's Batman and Bruce Wayne. And I think he really pulled it off. In the role of Jim Gordon is a guy I constantly see fan-casted as him, Brian Cranston. And I'll admit, I wasn't sold on the fan-castings, I think he's a tremendous actor, but I think sometimes people kind of forget if something is in an actor's range and instead go, oh, they look like him. That can't put him in it. it that's, that's all you need. A passing resemblance, and you got the part. So I thought that people really wanted to see him because he vaguely looked like Jim Gord at one point in time. And by that logic, I don't know, he should play a live-action Ned Flanders in an upcoming Simpsons movie. But after hearing him here, yeah, I get it. John Polito, God rest his soul, made for a good bad cop, playing Commissioner Loeb in his absolute infamy. Elijah Dushku will always not only be a great choice, but will always be the perfect choice for playing Catwoman. 
And then they also had Zigbar as a thug. So overall, there were some pretty talented people attached to the project. As if. All in all, I would have to say this is actually one of my favorite Batman movies. I think it makes it in my top five, but if it doesn't, then it only just came a little bit short of it. Although, like I said, I could have really, really used a little bit more of it, but that's my own selfishness in wanting to see more of this interpretation. So you can mark this down as an absolute stamp of approval on my part. Batman Year One was a film focused on the first year in the Dark Knight's crime-fighting career. But that story didn't necessarily end there. Unbeknownst to me, until very recently, a DC short was made that follows those events. As the cast and characters they were portraying return to their roles for this near 15-minute flick. It's a beautiful suit, isn't it? This time around, it isn't the Cape Crusader that we're following, but instead his feline friend. Or, I guess in this case, foe. This DC showcase showcases Catwoman as she takes on the city's newest crime boss. The short does introduce us to new characters, who are not only not in the movie that this is attached to, but just never in Batman lore to begin with, as this showcase's main antagonist is a diamond grilled having gangster named Ruffka. He's a diamond smuggler with diamond teeth who pays strippers and chunks of diamonds. He's, he is gold member, but with diamonds. It's a bit much. Even Mr. Freeze would say that this is an excessive use of ice. Chill. Catwoman tracks Rough Cut down to a strip club where she takes the spot of one of the dancers. And it genuinely feels like this was the major factor that inspired this short. It didn't need to be made, but this scene specifically is why it was made. I'm not complaining either, I'm, I'm just saying. I feel like someone was very passionate about this routine. Though this striptease doesn't end with the climax you might be thinking. <laughs> Following a beatdown comes a chase, that is then followed by a layered final battle. While the movie this was attached to puts a very heavy emphasis on narrative, this presentation is very sequence oriented. The animation of the action is always impressive. But it's surprising seeing this in something attached to a story that didn't have a whole lot of wow factor. The two seem tonally different, and outside of the returning cast and animation, don't seem to be one and the same. In trying to track down the smugglers, she manages to save a truck full of trafficked girls, one of which being her buddy Holly Robinson, who she had been watching over in the previous film. I think this short does a better job of establishing and explaining the Catwoman character than the actual movie did. Because there, she barely plays a role. I don't think the movie was really trying to properly depict her, they were just trying to use her as a plot point. I mean, in the story, she's just sort of stumbled upon. She's there long enough to make an impression, but not enough for audiences to get the full picture of who she is or what she does. To credit this, this clarifies that. I think in some ways, this short plays out like a deleted scene from the movie. Or better yet, this short is what would happen if movies started having DLC. It's definitely a continuation of that movie, but I, I don't feel like anything is really being furthered. They're conveying the character much better here than there, but there's nothing new going on. There's no added developments that play an integral part or change anything from that movie. This is just its own thing that didn't need to happen that just so happens to be attached to that movie. I get that this takes place in the same universe as that first Batman movie, but it doesn't really continue where that story left off. This isn't picking up a dropped plot thread. This is a story that just so happens to take place in the same place that that last one did. At the end of the day, is this short really necessary? Well, no. No, absolutely not. Not at all. It was fine to just leave things the way they were. But this short does give us a little bit more insight to some of the characters, as well as show the audience what Catwoman is capable of. I think she was tragically underutilized in year one, so having a short solo story showing her off does at least attempt to right that wrong a little bit. And I'm never going to complain about more Elijah Dushku as Catwoman. She's kind of the perfect fit. Emphasis on perk. I would love to come back and do this again. I absolutely have a, a personal interest in, in liking and liking and feel for Catwoman. It felt like something I would love to see go on and on and on because she's got a lot to do. Add to that the vocal talents of incredible voice actors and criminally underrated jokers in Kevin Michael Richardson and John DiMaggio, and I think you really almost have something here. 
Is it must-see? Not exactly, but I think it's at least worth one watch. It survives on its own. And actually, I think it may be better to view it that way rather than a sequel to Batman's first year. He's in his prime. He'll kill you. It's the only way I'll know. Here to talk to you about one of the most beloved animated adaptations of a Batman comic, The Dark Knight Returns, Part 1. And this is a movie that I've never seen, based on a comic book that I've never read. I've heard for years just how iconic this movie was, and how it's the perfect adaptation of the graphic novel of the same name. But I didn't care enough to see this movie, or to read that comic for a couple of reasons, which I'll be listing here now. Note that this list may also double as more reasons for you to hate me. For one, I found the whole art style aesthetically displeasing. I don't like that everyone looks so blocky. Like seriously, look at these character models. They look like Roblox characters with muscles. It's like what Syndrome said in The Incredibles. In a world where everybody's jacked... <laughs> then nobody is. Or at least I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how the line went. Why did they draw Batman to look like a miniature Incredible Hulk? Like, Batman looks like he could physically square up against Superman. Sans kryptonite-laced armored suit. Hell, you know what? Maybe not even just square up against him. He might be able to take him. Even the Joker, who's typically slender and almost feeble looking, fills out his suit jacket in this like he was stuffing a football vest underneath it. So yeah, the look? Not for me. Secondly, I've actually seen some clips from this movie before in passing, and I wasn't really a fan of anyone on the voice cast. Well, except for Conan O'Brien and Andy Richter, who were perfectly cast. But everyone else? Not so much. I'm not speaking in reference to the performances themselves, because I think, from the little bit I've seen, they're fine in terms of the performance, but the voices don't really seem to match the characters, and furthermore, don't seem to really match the character models. These just aren't the voices I'd expect to hear coming out of Batman and the Joker, or, or even Jim Gordon. Thirdly, and this might be a controversial opinion, I'm not sure, but I don't like the mutants. Not the type of characters I want to see in a Batman movie, or comic for that matter. Look, I like mutants. I do, I truly, I do. There are certain combinations that I just question. Like, there are two things that I like separately, but I don't like them as much when you put them together. For example, I like vampires, I like Spider-Man. I have never been into seeing Spider-Man fight off vampires. Sorry, Morby, I know that you made a more billion dollars at the box office, but just not for me. Just get the vampires away from Spider-Man and give them to Blade, because that makes sense. I'm okay with that. This is one of those cases. Because I like mutants, and I like Batman, but I don't want to see Batman and mutants combined. Well, except for this one time. That time was kind of cool. But that's a story for a different day. Here, once again, not so much. And fourthly, Bruce, get that goddamn mustache off of your face. You either have a baby face or stubble. Maybe a beard if you're feeling a little bit depressed. That's acceptable, but that's where all that ends. But a mustache? Never. You are Bruce Wayne, not Thomas Wayne. Also, it may be ironic for me of all people to say this, but... I also think, given the circumstances, that's what makes it okay for me to say this. But I don't want to see a bald two-face either. I know, I know, I should want some fair representation for my community. The League of Later Lex Luthers. But I'm sorry, that's just not how I wanted to see Harvey Dent. Not to mention, I always thought that Carrie Kelly looked a little bit goofy to me. What, I'm supposed to believe all of a sudden that Velma from Scooby-Doo is Robin? Yeah, that's a hard sell. Actually, my main gripe really is just that she doesn't have a mask to conceal her identity. She just put on Jubilee's glasses and called it a day. Like, hello, yes, I see you and I know who you are. I can accurately describe you to a GCPD sketch artist. Okay, so maybe I'm kidding for the most part on this last one, but those previous three entries were really big things for me, and all valid reasons, in my mind at least, for me to not check this out. Until now. Now before I continue, I want to go on record to say that I'm very aware of the story's significance. A lot of people credit the comics of the same name for revitalizing and even reimagining the character. I also know that this story, or at least elements from this story, 
were the inspiration for a lot of what's been done with these characters over the years. It's clear as day. You can make many, many different parallels between things that happen in The Dark Knight Returns and things that happen in billions of other Batman stories. Whether it be in terms of tone or literal elements that were borrowed from this continuity and made to fit into a different canon. Credit is obviously due here. And while I love what this was the catalyst for, going into this I don't think that I'm going to be a huge fan of its starting point. But I guess I'll see, as I'm recording this portion of the video before I watch the actual movie. So I guess I'll talk to you soon. Uh, sooner for you than for me, but soon nonetheless. Please stand by. So I just watched The Dark Knight Returns Part 1, and man, do I have a lot to say. First and foremost, I know a lot of people don't want to see their heroes get older. Superman shouldn't be a granddaddy. Deadpool shouldn't be collecting social security. And Spider-Man... Well, Spider-Man can't even graduate college. I, however, really, really like Old Man Bruce stories. I like the idea that he's getting up there in age and he still refuses to stop fighting the good fight. It makes him less overpowered and much more vulnerable. But it still speaks volumes to his overall inner strength and willpower and his undying need to seek out justice knowing that it will never truly be enough. Knowing that his window of opportunity to clean up Gotham City is slowly starting to close. Conceptually, I love that. And in execution here, well, I also love that. There are so many things you can do with these type of stories. I would even argue that these are the most interesting type of Batman stories. Because let's face it, anything you put the Dark Knight up against Readers, audience members, die-hard comic book fans, and the casual viewer always expect him to defeat it with ease. For one simple reason. Because he's Batman. But you put a much older, fragile, and frail Batman out there, and now you've given the character some limitations. I would say this movie is very fair in its depiction of an older Batman. He's still the skilled veteran vigilante. You know, the guy could still dance the dance, it's just... He's doing it with a bad back and a bad hip. He's still smart, he's still strong, he's just, unfortunately, a little bit stale. He's past his prime and he's gotten crime-fighting rust. This movie does a good job of showing that he's still capable of doing what he used to do, even if he can't do it necessarily at the same speed and with the same accuracy that he used to do these things. And despite whatever his new shortcomings are, there's still that same fight in him that there always was and more importantly, that same fight from him. This senior citizen is not above kicking some random thug's ass, or trying to take down a mutant leader. I love the way this movie portrays Bruce Wayne. It showcases him as a man who's so haunted by his past that it completely blinds him to his present and his future. A man who has lived through darkness and spent his life desperately trying to create light, sacrificing all that he had even when it was something that wasn't his to sacrifice. This movie very early on establishes Batman's never back down attitude. Standing up for what you believe in, even in the face of ration and logic. For better or worse, that is Batman. Like this man is not gonna back down from a fight, even if he's going into said fight knowing that he's gonna lose. Because Batman is perseverance. Even after going into retirement due to the health issues that come with age, he still can't help himself. He puts the cape and the cowl back on despite his better judgment. Despite knowing that at this point in time, the United States have basically villainized heroes. Vigilantes may still be needed, but they're very clearly unwanted. Gotham City needs Batman, but more importantly, Bruce Wayne needs Batman. Not only is the city at war with new threats without the Caped Crusader, but Bruce is at war with himself without the Dark Knight. Simply put, without the Bat, the man is devoid of reason to exist. At this point, he's not living anymore, he's just... surviving. As I've said before on this channel in several videos, despite what one may think, Bruce Wayne is actually the mask. And Batman, believe it or not, is the guy's true identity. When he puts that mask on, he becomes who he truly is. And anything before he dons the cowl is just a persona. So giving up being a superhero to play an aging billionaire playboy 
made Bruce a hollow husk of a man. He was no longer the person, he was now just stuck being the performance. A shallow shell of what once was but never will be again. A lost soul wandering the earth. But being Batman again woke him up and gave him purpose. Not unlike the previously comatose Joker, who spent a decade as a patient watching paint dry patients. When Bruce Wayne decided to return to crime fighting, the Joker decided to return to crime. Because being Batman not only gives Batman purpose, it unfortunately gives the Joker purpose as well. It's a really interesting parallel between these two forever foes. Gotham needs Batman, Bruce Wayne needs Batman, and the Joker needs Batman. Another interesting parallel is made between Batman and Two-Face, in terms of both having a dual identity, an extension of oneself that can contribute but more often contradicts or conflicts and at times even corrupts the other personality's plans and motivations. Both Batman and Two-Face succumb to the darker sides of their personalities in this movie. But these two separate identities bring these two men down two separate paths. In this, Harvey is given an incredible plastic surgeon who manages to completely reconstruct his face, evening it out and returning him to the handsome Harvey that Gotham once knew and loved. It would seem like Gotham's White Knight is finally cured, except he isn't. Because it isn't Harvey's physical scars that make him Two-Face, it's his psychological scars that make him Two-Face. The ones that others are blind to, the ones that people can't see, but the ones that he sees every day. While others look upon him and see a clean bill of health, he sees and feels only his illness, as it's now consumed him entirely. The tragic tale of Two-Face only continues on, with no real resolve in sight, which really isn't all that different from the Ballad of the Bat. No ending in sight. No light at the end of the tunnel, just the darkness that that metaphorical mental tunnel holds. Neither Bruce Wayne nor Harvey Dent are able to escape that darker, dominant side of their personalities. I said it before on this channel, and I'll try not to repeat myself too much, Harvey and Bruce are the same currency. They're just different sides of the coin. Carrie Kelly, while being a little bit underdeveloped as a character, is a harmless, mostly welcome addition to the story. I think she makes sense here because Batman was always trying to set up the next generation of crime fighters. So it makes sense that he would take her under his bat wing when he has significantly less years under the cowl left. Like someone's gonna have to take the throne. I think it makes sense that he would mentor her, especially when she's taken so much of an initiative. Unlike most of the other canonical Robins, Carrie isn't an orphan, but honestly, she might as well be. Her parents just aren't present. And I mean that both in terms of her life and in terms of the story. We hear them in the background a couple times, but they don't exactly seem like uh, great parental figures or upstanding citizens. We hear them, but they're never talking to or about their daughter. As a matter of fact, she might as well not even exist. And they might as well not even have a place in the story because we never physically see them. They're just voices from another room. And I think this is done intentionally because I think that that's what they are to carry as well. Not just the viewer. They're apparently just lazy stoners who don't care for their child. Which feels like a very, very, very dated take on the whole pothead experience. Like, excuse me, Frank, I didn't come here to be attacked. But if you're gonna do it, like, at least attack me with something relevant and valid. Carrie's shown to be intelligent and resourceful, but she doesn't really have all that much of a personality outside of what the story needs her to be. Still, she manages to make one hell of an impression on Batman after saving his life. So much of an impression that Batman immediately blurts out his secret identity. You know, again, w w when you have less time to do these things, sometimes you gotta rush through them. It probably didn't hurt that she just so happened to be wearing a Robin suit. The movie's opening is very exposition heavy. It gets everyone caught up with the background of the character and Gotham City at this present point in time. It immediately lets them in on what the story's gonna be and it allows it to unravel in a very natural way. The way in which the dialogue unfolds feels genuine. Having the story start with two old friends, two several decade long colleagues chatting and reminiscing about old times while comparing their past to the present, that's smart. We're learning so much from this one interaction. Learning about the characters, learning the characters' relationships, learning about the world that they're living in, 
learning about the circumstances that surround this meeting, and learning about their past failures. This back and forth feels real, and it does what it needs to do, doing a whole lot in just a very limited amount of time. All while making this information dump not feel overwhelming or entirely fictitious. It's a small thing to look past, sure, but I think it's definitely something that should be applauded. The dialogues and monologues that follow this are all still on the same par as well. It never once feels like it's lacking, except when the mutants start to speak. The mutant speech patterns, the way they speak, I, I think I could have went without, but then again, I, I could have went without the mutants in general. I don't know, they just got this weird Cloud Atlas talk, and quite frankly, I I'm just not into it. I like the inclusion of characters from outside the Batman Gotham City jurisdiction. Seeing people from Metropolis weigh in or play into the plot makes everything feel like that much bigger of a deal. There's a lot going on in this, which make the events feel much more grand in scale. Though at times it feels like there's so much going on that it makes certain plot points seem a little bit glossed over or just rushed. The plot is always rapidly advancing for better or worse. We go from important moment to important moment. There's not a whole lot of filler here. Actually, there's none whatsoever. This movie doesn't really take its time. It throws you into things, and then things just continue to happen. There's no, there's no slow it down and try to figure things out. You just need to stick through this ride. It's a roller coaster from the get-go. Does it get a little too on the nose politically from time to time? Yeah, it's a bit obvious and a little bit annoying. Like, yes, Frank, I understand you don't like people on the left. But maybe uh, don't make that a giant part of your Batman movie. Or, or comic book. I'm really not a political person. I don't involve myself in them. So I really don't have a dog in this fight. But I just want to keep the proverbial dog fighting away from my Batman story, personally. That's just, that's just my own thing. To be fair, some of the time it seems like it's trying to make a valid point or critique or commentary on something, but it very quickly falls into parody and its message almost completely gets lost in translation. So overall, strangely enough, I actually kind of love this movie, in spite of all the things I don't like about it. My opinions from the start of the video haven't really changed. I still don't like this art style, I still don't like the voices. At times I feel like this movie is an assault on my eyes and ears, no disrespect intended to anybody involved. But visually and audibly, I'm not the biggest fan of this movie. And movies are a visual and audible medium, but the content of this movie is so great that I can manage to look past all of these things. This movie is phenomenal in spite of itself. The story completely understands and does justice to each of its characters. It has a lot to say socially, psychologically, politically, if that's your thing. This isn't just some shallow, thoughtless Batman story. It's a mostly well-crafted story structured around fighting for your beliefs even when your body is fighting against you, amongst various other things. Simply put, they understood the assignment. Even if they didn't have the best front cover page, they understood the assignment. The movie's actually so good that shortly into watching this, what kept me from watching it originally stopped bothering me almost instantaneously. I really enjoyed this and I sincerely hope that part two is on par with part one. You're the Joker, right? Batman's gonna kick your ass. He's gonna have to go through you first. I've previously talked about The Dark Knight Returns part one. So if you haven't seen that video, I highly suggest checking it out before watching this one. Because otherwise, you're going to be all kinds of confused. Although, granted, due to the subject matter of this video, had you watched part one, you still might be really confused. So y'all remember when I said I really hope that part two is on par with part one? I really enjoyed this and I sincerely hope that part two is on par with part one. See, I did say that. Very clever. A lot of you guys have touted this as being even better than the first part. But I'm just gonna be real with y'all. I'm sorry, I don't see it. As a matter of fact, I feel like part two is significantly worse than part one. That's not to say that it's necessarily bad, just, it's just not as good as part one. It's a lot more goofy and bizarre, but it's still trying to treat its material as if it was as legit as the first part. But once again, it's really not. 
there's a lot of strange choices here that kind of make me feel like Frank Miller was starting to lean closer toward all-star Batman and Robin rather than Batman Year One. Like having Bruce go undercover as an elderly lady, lipstick mind control, whatever the fuck these two things are. The movie feels more like an exercise in testing my suspension of disbelief. And shortly into its runtime, it was already broken. And if I thought the last part was political, well, that's because it was, but man, I had no idea what part two had in store for me. From President Ronald Reagan playing into the plot, to having a Nazi for a villain, constant talks of fascism, and the movie's depiction of stupid, bleeding heart liberals. Which aren't my words, they're Frank Miller's. Uh, probably. Again, I'm not a political person. I don't really take overall sides. I take the side that makes sense to me in given situations. I don't believe in absolutes. If you go into anything saying that this is your guy and you will defend them no matter what, then clearly you've made up your mind before anybody's had anything to say. That is just my own perception. But it's very clear that this movie's message is that the left is loony. There's an emphasis put on responsibility and lack thereof. Having those who oppose Batman blame him for the crimes of all of his villains, while claiming his villains are merely victims of Batman's own psychosis and narcissism, is completely ludicrous. I think that there could be some interesting commentary there, because that's a thought-provoking thought. Does Batman do more harm than good? Is his influence stopping more crimes than it's potentially starting? Does the media portraying a masked vigilante as a heroic icon play any part in all of these villains taking to the streets in their own homemade Comic-Con gear? These are some great questions that I think have been much better explored in various other Batman projects. But here it comes off as a little bit too... Uh, satirical. L like, like, the whole thing just comes off as parody. Sure, a claim could reasonably be made that Batman's prominence maybe on some levels enables all of these kooks, but at the end of the day, these villains are responsible for their own actions. Very few, if any, would argue that. Let alone the way the people in this movie try to argue that. Like, yes, the Joker is merely a victim of Batman and nothing more. The movie says he killed 600 people, but none of that is his own fault. Let's release him back into the wild and see what happens. You know, because Batman is the real bad guy. The message gets even further muddled when later on in the runtime, Batman himself says something that seems to imply he subscribes to that same theory. All the people I've murdered by letting you live. I never kept count. I did. So what was the point that was being made here? Was there even a point? I'm questioning it. Maybe you should have done that too when you were writing this. I mentioned before that Frank Miller clearly didn't like the left, but he's not above shitting on the right either. Like with his depiction of former President Ronald Reagan, where he's shown to be a complete bullshit artist. Or how he makes Superman a complete puppet of the law. A seemingly mindless drone that just follows whatever order he's given, rather than being a figure of hope and justice. It seems like Frank was venting his criticisms of both sides of the political spectrum, and he did so by mocking their most diehard extremists. Unfortunately, at times, it feels like it comes at the price of the story that's being told. And on top of that, the extremists are the only depiction of either side that is ever presented in these movies. And if Frank Miller is so diehard anti-extremism, then why does he have Batman team up with and utilize members of the mutant gang who are the very definition of the word extreme? I mean, I understand Batman's getting up there in age. His bones are quickly turning to dust and his muscles are slowly turning into soup. I get that the guy needs help. Hell, he was never above that before when he was at his peak and in his prime. My dude had a whole ass Batman family that nowadays feels much more like a Batman extended family. So yeah, by no means would he be above this. But like, you know, I, I would think that he would vet some of these guys out. Not everyone deserves admission into the fight for the right. There are some who just don't belong. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But I feel like Batman wouldn't want just a bunch of husks who do the right thing because it's what they're told to do. 
You'd want people who do the right thing for the right reasons. These guys aren't following the old man's orders because they want to see some good in the world. They're doing it because they're mindless followers who think Batman is cool. Really, he just adopted the gang because he beat their boss. So I guess the mutants run under prison rules. I mean, Superman is shown to be in the wrong because he just follows orders, and yet Batman is now associating with a bunch of people who just mindlessly follow orders. Sometimes it's really confusing because I feel like there's things in this movie, and I would guess by extension the comic book that it's based on, though I would not know for sure, there are times where it feels like it's trying to make a point, but it seems like these points are counterproductive of their own narratives. I do like that the mutants jump from leader to leader and just go with whatever the current thing is. They change their motives and appearances to better suit whoever they're working for. Which seems like an old man's take on kids these days, and the dangers of being a rebel without a cause. To be frank, no pun intended, I do think that there could be some validity to that. So, Some. I mean, yes, that also does come off as parody, but it, it, I, I'm accepting of that. That's not too egregious. I'm fine with the way that that was done. Is it on the nose? Yes. Most things in part two are. The movie succeeds in properly portraying Batman's hatred for guns and his appreciation for human life, even the worst of humanity. But unfortunately, it also makes Batman openly state that he needs to kill the Joker in order to stop him. Like, like this is his solution. And hey, look, I get it. He's done a lot of wrong. Maybe death truly is the only solution to stop this madman. As a wise alien once said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So taking one life to save 100 lives or let's be honest, more likely one million lives, does seem moral and just. But I just don't think that that's a conclusion that Batman himself should come to. Even if he's older, even if he's running out of time, I just don't think Batman should openly state, oh yeah, got, gotta kill the clown. Gotta kill the clown, should have done it years ago, gotta kill the clown. I don't think my issue is with Batman trying to kill the Joker necessarily, I mean, I personally would prefer that he did not, because that does seem a little bit out of character. But there are ways to do a story like this and have it be reasonable. In The Killing Joke, I never minded that Batman allegedly killed the Joker at the end of it. As a matter of fact, in that telling of the tale, I welcomed it. But that's because it was almost impulsive. There wasn't a plan in place for Batman to end his life. If Batman does kill the Joker, it should be because in that one moment, Joker did something so terrible that he temporarily snapped. He did all he could think to do at that one instant. It definitely shouldn't be something that he, he thought over, like this shouldn't be premeditated. It should be instinctual. Also thought it was a little bit much to see Batman blatantly spit on Joker's corpse. That just didn't seem within reason for Batman. Even after everything that transpired between these two, it just, it just seems so low class and improper for the Dark Knight. I'm not saying that Batman should hold a candlelight vigil. I'm not expecting him to take to YouTube with his own custom-made Joker tribute set to Kenny Rogers through the years. But like, just the disrespect there. Ah, oh, it's gross. Come on, Bats. You're better than that. Or, or at least I thought you were. I know Frank Miller isn't. I will say that there are a lot of interesting things happening in the movie. Batman coming back an ancient relic to an ever-evolving world is a very, very interesting concept. His return to the cowl just so happened to coincide with the changing of the guard. Following James Gordon's retirement, a new commissioner with a new policy takes over the position. Commissioner Yendel doesn't seem to have the same fondness for Batman that Gordon once did. Although eventually she does come around to see his way of thinking. And it's a nice touch just watching history repeat itself. Just now for a new generation. In some ways, this feels like a remake of Batman Year One. The commissioner opposes vigilanteism, and then at the end of it is like, well crap, we kinda need this guy, don't we? Yeah, alright. Okay, we'll give him a pass. We'll give him a pass. Though I don't think they'll be exchanging notes over coffee anytime soon, it is nice to see the new commissioner appreciate Batman the same way the previous one did. 
This Joker matches up to the character that I know in terms of motivations and having a bunch of funny one-liners. In terms of depicting the Clown Prince of Crime, this movie triumphs in direction. His obsession with Batman is still very much in effect. It even goes so far as to him speaking to him more as if they were past lovers rather than lifelong enemies. It's not an awful interpretation of the dynamic between these two at all, but outside of that, I hate everything about this character. His design, the performance of the actor, the sound of his voice. I, I'm just straight up not a fan. For me, this performance belongs in the low tier of Joker performances. There is a spot right next to Jared Leto's Joker from Suicide Squad and the Joker from Batman Dark Tomorrow. In case you're wondering, the seat over from that is actually the Joker from Young Justice. I'm sorry, Data. You've been great in a lot of things. This just wasn't one of them. But I look forward to seeing you in the Master Disguise Part 2. Despite him having an ill-fitting voice and a bland at best design, on a lot of levels, I do feel like this movie accurately provided the Joker experience. Remember in part one when I said Carrie Kelly was underdeveloped? Well, that's all the development you're getting for her. Because she never really gets fleshed out. Her backstory never becomes crystal clear. Her reasonings for wanting to be Robin are never made entirely apparent. And character-wise, she's kind of a blank slate. It's sad because I actually want to like this character, but I just don't know enough about her. Considering that Frank Miller was writing, maybe he didn't really know a whole lot about her either. Look, the guy has definitely done some great things with Batman, and also some not-so-great things with Batman. That's a, that's a video for a different day. But let's just say his development and depiction of women in his comics was almost always very lacking. I'm really annoyed by this because I think voice performance-wise, Ariel Winter was my favorite out of anybody on the cast. She just doesn't have a whole lot to do. Instead, the heavy lifting goes to people who don't seem like they're right for the roles that they're in. So the whole thing is just very frustrating. Although, hey, wait a second. I I'm just putting something together here. I, I don't know if it's true or false, but this design, but Carrie Kelly, is she why Dick Grayson has the design that he does in the Lego Batman movie? Because he's the spitting image of her in that. Spitting image is a phrase, Bruce. Unneeded. Unnecessary. I do like the dynamic between Superman and Batman. And their interactions almost saved this movie for me. Almost. To me, this is what Batman v Superman should have been. Because a fight between these two should be about so much more than just two jacked up dudes in pajama going punch for punch. It's a fight of ideologies. It's a fight of two people who live for justice, who want to do the right thing, but have to fight each other to do it. Because their perception of what's right not only differ, but completely conflict. Batman listens to his moral compass, while Superman listens to the authorities. I like that. I like the compare and contrast that can be made between these two. And I love that even when they're fighting, even when Supes has been given very specific orders on what to do with Batman, he still spends his time in that fight trying to get Batman to stand down and to reason with him. I will say, this movie doesn't cast a fantastic light on Superman, but it also doesn't throw him obliviously into the realm of darkness. While he's kicking Bruce Wayne's badass, he still begs and pleads with him to stop fighting, showing compassion and concern even when he's just been struck by a kryptonite arrow. As Batman's laying in the final blows and basically gloating to Clark that he's defeated him, Clark's attention is primarily on Bruce's irregular heartbeat, which I think really highlights the Superman that I know. This line at the end of the movie, too... Were you a friend? I think so. I honestly couldn't say. Sounds about right. Chef's kiss. I think it's the perfect betrayal of Clark and Bruce's mutual respect and obviously unspoken friendship. Even those closest to Batman still don't really know where they stand with him. That's not by mistake, that's by design. The guy takes being a man of mystery to a completely different level. Can we just talk about how one-armed Ollie still kicks ass? I mean, he's not cracking jokes, and, and that hurts. Because Ollie's signature sarcastic wit has always been my personal favorite part of the character, as it's the part that I personally have always identified with, 
But you know, now that he's old and has no hair on the top of his head, I find myself identifying with other parts of the character instead. Truthfully speaking, while there were a lot of great moments and interesting premises in Part 2, it still failed to live up to the greatness of Part 1 for me. I found this movie to be mostly disappointing with a slew of lows and a couple of highs that feel like they were more in place with the first half of the story. So overall, yeah, I could have left at Part 1 and been a whole lot happier. But I am glad that I finally got to see this in full, and now I understand what everybody's been talking to me about for years. So does The Dark Knight Returns live up to the hype? The answer is very simply, yes and no. The Dark Knight Returns Part 2, even more so than Part 1, is a mixed bag. There's a lot that I liked, and there's a lot that I didn't. Overall, for the most part, when looking back on these two movies and seeing them as one full one, I think it just about evens out for me. There is just as much good as there is bad, and vice versa. So now that I've watched both parts, I gotta say, it's pretty good. Not great, I don't think that I loved it the way a lot of other people seem to love it. I think that there's a lot of flaws in it that a lot of people don't let on to, and it does impact my enjoyment of the final product. I don't like the art designs, I don't like a lot of the voices, I think that the messages get muddled throughout, but putting all those aside, I do genuinely kinda like this. But that's just my take. Let me know yours in the comment section below, and if you enjoyed this video, and want to see more Batman content coming up, let me know in the same comment section by saying, V, you're an all-star Batman content creator. Let's just say that that comment isn't nearly as complimentary as it sounds. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.